um, would have to be uh, part of that. And, and voice is another piece of all of this, that voice control has uh, just taken off just in the last year or two. I think we'll see <coughs> more and more of that be uh, more sensibly integrated into sort of this um, uh, AI uh, element of um, real-time, even real-time real um, streaming uh, to, uh, it, it's not really streaming in the sense of, uh, you've seen these new translate um, uh, uh, architectures where you can do kind of a real-time um, translation. That's a huge AI, that's like Google translates the, the world's largest AI application by far. Mm. Um, and so I think that, a lot of that is stuff that's flowing on the internet. Well, whether you consider that streaming or not, it is voice, it's audio. Right. Um, and so that's a, another important part of the business that uh, I think will, will come along. So those are just two things right there, the metadata and, and voice activation, um, I think will be big growth, uh, have both have big uh, growth and importance, increasing importance over the next few years. Okay, great. Any other thoughts on what's driving the business? What, what do we need to drive the business? And if not, I can go on to the next one. Well, I find sort of the, the businesses that are different, quite different to, to mine, to what I do. And so I would consider my business sort of production, obviously creating shows, and then the LinkedIn business and what it is. But the interesting ones that I've gotten from this uh, conference are this, this idea of the tips and, the, and the, the direct payment back to producers. Like, what, what Twitch does. So that's still a small, I mean, it's probably a minuscule um, part of the market in that sense, but that's, that seems to be driving growth um, the fastest, at least on the, in, in that segment. So the idea that somebody has what they call a tip jar and they can drop essentially small amounts of payment in credits or, or a small payment to those producers, those content creators, and, and reward them for what they're doing. Yeah, and I think that immediately turns around if I watch some of that content, you'll see a producer that starts off with a relatively small audience and five bucks a month. And I think Twitch lets you go up to 25 maybe now. And obviously your system allows, yeah. allows part of that. You'll see their production value go, right? grow. So that's where you'll see your, their okay. tool grow. So they're going to go okay. from their laptop and wirecast or whatever it may be up to a camera. And you'll see, you'll see that kind of growth. All right, cool. Well, we've talked pretty optimistically about a lot of things that might drive live streaming to higher levels in the future. Let's take a few minutes to be realists or even skeptics and talk about what the challenges that we as an industry might be facing while trying to achieve those high levels of streaming growth. And we'll spend five or 10 minutes on this so we can get to the, the technology aspect as well. So if each of you or any of you have just some brief thoughts on what some of those challenges are, I think we've talked about a few of them, some content discovery, uh, some things like that. that you know, I'd just let's highlight those very quickly. Uh, and, and see what you guys think about that. Yeah, to really following up what you were talking about though, this, this contribution and ingest problem that will occur with a number of people mm -hmm. uh, contributing content. Yep, first and one even, yeah, and even for us, getting our content out from multiple spaces up. So there's technology that will help with that on, you know, I know you're gonna roll into that next on the HEBC side, but even some of the other pieces that were talked about this week, the SRT, um, alliance piece which allow, would allow us to be more reliably send content up. And so the more points of ingest that we're going to start to have, we have to think about the infrastructure, the protocols, and, uh, and the systems to allow us to do that. So that, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think um, <clears throat> as the uh, industry matures, uh, government regulation is a really big challenge, um, mm. especially for uh, you know, content. Like You can see that with uh, live streaming in China right now where the government is sort of like cracking down on um, you know, inappropriate or, or harmful uh, content. And um, uh, I think as it grows here, uh, it's probably gonna happen too. I mean, uh, you already have YouTube on a sort of demonetization purge right now where um, you know, all these brands um, are finally noticing that uh, they were supporting uh, you know, all these content creators who have inappropriate videos or uh, you know, just really like, just really uh, I don't know, politically incorrect videos, and they want to start pulling their channel, like, you know, their videos, um, so that, uh, you know, they can't make money off of that anymore. So, you know, mm. it's something that content creators have to think about now is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the type of, uh, uh, just, you know, making sure that they're not offensive. Uh, right, like so that. to some extent, self-regulation before somebody else clamps regulations down on top. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, something that's actually really funny is um, 
I read somewhere that uh, in uh, in China, uh, I guess you know, if you're live streaming and you're a woman, you can't eat a banana on stream because it's uh, you know erotic. But a man can. So I mean, hmm. I don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think the, there's a lot of challenges inherent in the online video business as we transition to live. I mean, it was really, the world is really architected for on-demand VOD playback. If you want to go watch a music video today, you go to Vivo, a TV show on Hulu, a movie on Netflix, and anything and everything on YouTube and, and iTunes. What the market didn't contemplate was this dual explosion of connected devices where we'd go from 10 billion in 2012 up to potentially 50 to 75 billion in 2020 combined with this propagation and explosion of social media tools. So, and the quality of the video has gotten better on smartphones. So now there's this rabid demand to consume, especially in our minds, premium live video. And now we have to create and navigate through those challenges and those inherent problems. But we found in terms of, uh, of quality execution, identifying people that have an understanding of the challenges of live television and how that translates to a smartphone or a connected device. And you know, today, executing a Coachella is not, it's a very daunting task. You're producing content on up to seven stages simultaneously. We're delivering out to audiences in the millions and on a thousand plus different device profiles. And now you have to accommodate people that want to post, comment, share, tweet, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot to um, address and deal with going forward, but I think a lot of it stems back to how the, the business has kind of come to life. It's also been, I think, very unexpected. And in the world, I think we're gonna go for another one billion people will get internet connectivity in the next three or four years, and another 10 billion devices are with internet connectivity are gonna enter the market. So it's a opportunity that's also got some challenges to it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and broadcasters are, are pretty sensitive to this. They're, they've built their businesses on the whole premise of a lot of people watching the same thing at exactly right. the same time. Worst case scenario for, <clears throat> for streaming, right? right. Um, so their, their uh, sensitivity to that scale issue mm -hmm. and congestion is, is really, uh, r r really uh, high. So that, that's why they, they need to be um, assured that things are going to get better. So HEVC comes along, that helps a lot, but you, Ultra HD basically takes all that advantage back right to, to, to zero because, right. you know, if you, you get two or four times better efficiency Ultra HD uh, over HD, then Ultra HD just uh, eats that right back up. So it's, um, and, and broadcasters are, are already looking and already recording a lot of their programming in Ultra HD, even though they're not necessarily delivering it that way yet, they're putting it in their archive. So that's uh, going to be the continuing, you know, even as the networks um, uh, can uh, continue to grow and, and, and uh, have capability growing to, to be able to serve more people with less congestion, it's um, still, you know, kind of chasing its tail in terms of <clears throat> how much you can actually benefit over that for the worst case, you know, real time, everybody watching, a lot of people watching at once, the Super Bowl problem, as we call it today, or as we used to call it, Victoria's Secret problem. I mean, right. we've all, <laughs> we've been, been through a, a lot of these con congestion crises that we remember, and uh, that's going that to continue to be right a problem. I think that the broadcasters really have an advantage here, because you have a guaranteed channel that can go to unlimited number of people. But the problem is, as, as you stated, is that the amount of content has to be limited, right? Yeah. You can have only a few dozen channels on air in each right. geographical location, and you can have maybe 500 channels on cable on satellite, but that's it. Yeah, the, the scalability the, problem in broadcast is the scarcity of, of, of channels. Of channels, and okay. It's, so it's, so uh, now, maybe we need to think about the model. If somebody is very popular and millions of people want to view that person, we need to put them in broadcast, right? And how do we do that dynamically, okay? Like uh, <laughs> this person in China walking around eating a banana. Now 20 <laughs> billion people want to watch him. I don't know why. Maybe some event has happened. Uh, how do we get that person on a cable channel? How do we get him on an over-the-air channel and, and not have this uh, notion that, you know, there's only license for like dozen number of channels, you know, only ABC, C, uh, you know, NBC, CBS, they have the right, but all the others, they have to go over the internet with all the problems of, of congestion. So maybe we can build this type of highway 
that if there is a business model, because many people want to watch that type of content, we can immediately get that content on air, on broadcast, and make it available to all the uh, you know, right. millions and, of people. And to that point, uh, the, the Next Gen TV ATC3 system in, uh, includes real-time usage monitoring uh, backwards to the broadcaster. So they might have, and they've been thinking about this as a possibility, that ability to at least measure in real time and see where, whether, okay, it's time to shift something over to the online world because the viewership is down or vice versa um, and be able to maybe do that kind of dynamic oh. switching and then have the receiver be able to follow if somebody's watching it on one and, s and then with seamlessly uh, switch over to the other, uh, the, the other mode. Um, it sounds like science fiction today, but it's actually not, the, the tools are, are being developed to enable that down the, down the road. I Let's skip back, uh, uh, sorry, Aaron. Uh, I'm going to actually go back to something uh, Skip was talking about a minute ago, which was HEVC, because I want to touch on the technologies a little bit before we wrap up. And HEVC and Ultra, uh, Ultra HD and how those things are, are potentially going to help or potentially harm at the same time. Uh, what are your thoughts on how HEVC is actually going to help us as far as you know, reducing the bandwidth required to send the content, but on the other hand, HEVC requires more resources to encode the content and to play back the content and usually more expensive hardware at that. What are your thoughts on, on that really quickly? I think uh, really HEVC is the solution to address the, uh, the bandwidth issue. I mean, every generation of codec is a solution that helps relative to the previous generation. Uh, SD broadcast was done with MPEG-2 video. When they moved to HD, uh, it's H.264. And now for Ultra HD, it's HEVC that gives you another 50% benefit on uh, the bandwidth. Uh, so, so it solves that issue until the next step of 8K or VR or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, regarding the demands of HEVC, um, th there is kind of a, a notion that you must have hardware in order to encode HEVC, especially for 4K. And uh, you know we're a software company, so we're trying to, to break that uh, rule and uh, we've recently partnered uh, with Intel uh, trying to see what's the maximum capacity of HEVC and code you can get on a CPU in mm. pure software. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, luckily Intel is continuing with their progress of uh, having more cores and higher frequencies uh, inside their chips. Yep. And the latest high-end chip is the Intel Platinum 8180. This one has 28 cores. Uh, 28 physical cores and 28 hyper threads on each chip. So a dual socket platform has 112 threads. So we've optimized our software to run on that and we've done a lot of tuning, uh, eventually enabling us to run six channels of 4K P60 in HDR on a single server. So this is possible today. Now, I don't think uh, that any of you are aware of a 4K channel that is live 24-7 on the internet, right? This is something right. that's not there yet, but now with Apple's support of HEVC and Samsung's support and all the devices out there, I expect that there will be uh, several 4K channels um, out over the internet in 2018, and uh, you'll need the capacity to, to support that, to actually encode. Yep. What, what are your guys' thoughts on 4K and HDR and how they're going to play in? Yeah, we've been thinking a lot about that um, from the broadcast side. Uh, Korea has already launched ATSC 3.0, and they're doing a lot with 4K. Their, their target is, was getting it up and running for the Olympics, Winter Olympics. Um, the, the thing that we found with Ultra HD, it's got multiple components to it. Obviously, the spatial um, resolution increase, doubling, uh, is what we call 4K, was first. And it was pr first probably because it was the easiest. Um, and it, it, the, the others, uh, uh, high dynamic range, wide color gamut, 10 bit, um, and then um, high frame rate ultimately are the other elements. Uh, the, the, the 4K one is probably the least important of them because you really don't get the advantage of it unless you're watching really close to the screen or you have a very large screen, uh, right. 80 inches. Uh, so, so. so how will that impact this five years from now? Well, uh, if, whereas the others, all those other attributes you see at any distance, any screen size. And so we're, uh, broadcasters are really, and, and by the way, the, the bandwidth penalty is highest to deliver the 4K as right. opposed to all those other right. elements, right. they all take up less. And 
Plus, then the third element is that the sets, the ones even that have been out for a few years already, there, or even the first um, 4K sets, are do a pretty good job of upscaling uh, HD 2K right. content to 4K automatically. Mm -hmm. Where the other stuff, not so much. It, right. it has to be done, you know, creatively. And is HEVC is that going to be the way we get there to get that HDR and and, and you know, well, these additional well, facets besides just 4K? The, the sweet spot that we're finding with HEVC is, and the, the encoders haven't all been optimized even yet for for this um, use case. Is 1080p plus HDR mm -hmm. and white color and, right. and eventually HFR. Okay. And that's really seems to be a, a, a where our HEVC really would shine. Got it. Okay, so that's where we're headed towards a 1080p plus HDR and, and increased color space. From broadcast. For the, for, where, where, there's, yeah, yeah. Where, where you, even in, in the 6 megahertz channels that we have here, you're constrained. Um, but we want to play a number of channels. And, and okay. HEVC really works, continues to work for SD and HD content too with right. the, the bandwidth uh, savings. Okay. And I think this is relevant for mobile devices as well. Well, mm. yeah. because there are mobile phones today, like the Samsung S8, that have 4K resolution. Yep. But everybody turns that off because you can't see the pixels. They're so small. It right. doesn't make any sense and just draws right. more power. Yeah. But this phone has HDR. Yeah. And the new iPhones also have HDR. Mm -hmm. So I think 1080p in HDR to the mobile devices uh, will really be a compelling experience for the end user. And uh, I think HEVC will be used for this much more than it will be used for, uh, for 4K yeah. delivery. OK, I think we need to wrap up, given the time. But uh, I didn't see any hands up for questions. But if you have questions, please feel free to stay after and ask. In the meantime, thank you very much, for panelists, for sharing your thoughts uh, on where we're headed. And thank you, audience, for sticking around through the last uh, session of Live Streaming Summit. And safe travels home. <laughs>